I feel good, uh, even though I shouldn't. I'm chilling so hard, couldn't tell you where the hood is. Uh, I'm looking like a million bucks, sucker. I'm... Welcome to This Week in Music. My name's Ian Rogers, and we are here at historic Oceanway Studios right here on Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we are inside of a studio where they're recording today, so if you hear any uh, ambient music, that's because there's actually recording sessions going on uh, while we're here. And we're joined today by John Grady, and John runs the Nashville office of Crush Management. John, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm great. I, I wanted to start by, by just asking you a little bit about your, uh, your, your, your history, which is a... Wow. Well, we're not, and, and we, I don't want to spend the entire 30 minutes on it, but could you give us a, an abbreviated version of, of uh, how you came to be where you are? Because the Crush position is brand new. So I'd like to like to go back and, and talk about how you uh, how you got to where you are. Um, well, the crush position is brand new, um, and to talk about the rest of it would take a lot longer than thirty minutes. Um, how did you get into the music business? Period. Well, when you mention history, that's an interesting one because that's what I really am trained to be as a, is a history teacher. Really? Yeah. Did you actually uh, teach history? Yeah, I did. Where at? What, I taught what high level? High school, high school history wow. in Minnesota, where I went to college. Uh, and where did you grow up, Minnesota? No, I grew up in Nebraska. Went gotcha. to college in Minnesota because it was exotic. If you live in Nebraska, Minnesota is pretty exotic. Yeah, it's almost like Scandinavia. Well, what with trees and water and everything. Right. Um, yeah, I got a job. I didn't even know there was a music business until I interviewed for a job in 1976 while I was student teaching because I was broke. Um, and it was for a and Records in 1976 as a college rep. Wow, so you were in Minnesota, to, mm -hmm. you were, and you interviewed with A&M to, to be a Minnesota college rep. Uh, Midwest, yeah, I had 11 states in my first job. Wow, so that's getting in the car and going to record stores yep. and making sure the, the things are that's, the yeah, way they're supposed to be. Working with college concert committees and bookstores and whatnot. So where did you go from there? I stayed in Minnesota for the next 19 years, uh, I was a pop promotion man. I had my own retail store. I was a pop promotion man for 15 years. Um, uh, got into sales and marketing, moved to Los Angeles, was the head of marketing for Capitol Records, uh, and moved here to the Music City. Um, Who moved you here? Capital? Mercury Records uh, in 1993. Gotcha. Um, and that's uh, this is my 18th year in Nashville. What was what was that transition like? I mean, 1993 was the was the, really the start of the climb of, of the kind of the. Well, heyday. for me, it was Billy Ray Cyrus, Achy Breaky Heart. Um, that's what I moved here to do. Um, mostly, I moved here to get out of Los Angeles. Um, I had a great job. I just didn't enjoy Los Angeles. I think it's made for people at certain times of their life to right. be in Los Angeles. It wasn't my time of my life to be in Los Angeles. Nashville works for me, uh, personally. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a lifestyle thing and more than a music thing? Oh, it was very much a lifestyle thing, yeah. Um, Nashville's just easier for me. Uh, I live in the same house that I moved into 18 years ago. It takes me 10 minutes to get here to Historic Ocean Way from my house and takes me, it's about a three minute walk from my office of the uh, palatial building of Crush Nashville right up the street. Right, That's, that is great, great life. I uh, moved here, worked for Mercury for 10 years, um, started as a sales guy and ended up being pretty much the GM. Uh, we had we had a few successes. But which were? Uh, uh, well, it started out with Billy Ray Cyrus when I got here. Um, that was already moving, but we signed uh, Shania Twain, sold about 40 million records. Um, Toby Keith was signed at that point in time, Terry Clark. Uh, there was a little soundtrack that a bunch of people bought called Oh Brother Where Art Thou? Yeah. And all that started Lost Highway with uh, Lucinda and all of that. And then I went from there and had my own company uh, with... Uh, with T-Bone Burnett and the Coen Brothers, we had a record company called DMZ Music where we made Rodney Crowell records and Ralph Stanley records and a bunch of soundtracks. 
Uh, Let, to, let's talk about that for a minute. So you went from the, the sort of real pop side of country to, mm -hmm. I mean, Oh Brother Where Art Thou really, really kind of opened things up for, um, you know, for more more traditional country music and maybe even Yeah, considering Americana. it was a gospel record that everybody turned it into a bluegrass record, but... Um, well, and, 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 and it, I mean, it did phenomenally well. I don't know how many records it sold, but it won a Grammy. It won several well, it won CMAs. won nine Grammys and, yeah. um, <laughs> and sold about eight million pieces. So, wow. Yeah, it did okay. Of a gospel record that people call the bluegrass record. Yes, okay. that's the one. And so, but that, so did you look at that as opportunity? I mean, you said then you started Lost Highway, then you... Then you started a label with T-Bone Burnett, who produced Oh Brother, Where mm -hmm. Art Thou? So did you look at Oh Brother, Where Art Thou as this, um, as this moment, let's jump on the grenade and, and do more stuff? I looked at it as just a creative explosion and opportunity and that there were still enough people out there who um, liked music enough to be influenced by that. Um, as with about everything, phases and fads last so long, but there were a number of careers that branched out enormously from that whole uh, little interlude known as Oh Brother and Down from the Mountain. And during that period, then I uh, was uh, whisked away to run Sony Music in Nashville, uh, where we started another wave. Um, mostly into uh, real country and and southern rock mixtures at Sony Music. We, um, like that, what? Oh, like Gretchen Wilson came out of that period. Um, in fact, the music we hear in the background, uh, we made one of those records in this studio here. Uh, Miranda Lambert signed her at that period. Uh, we made some beautiful Patti Loveless and Rodney Crowell records. Uh, Montgomery Gentry went through their huge phases and I also, we had uh, Van Zant, the Van Zant brothers from Skinner and 38 Special had a bunch of success during that period. We and then it's great stuff. I mean, you know, you all, all the artists that you're mentioning are artists that I love. Are you are do you are you the ears there or like I mean it occurs to me that you're 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 definitely finding intersection of well, of, of I popular signed music them. And I was the president music. of the company. I signed them. I had a lot of help. Um, I, I don't consider myself really an expert in anything. Um, what I know about music is what everybody else knows about music, um, that you know if you like it or not. And I did see a crease. Marketing plan was pretty simple. Uh, I think most fans of country music interact with fans of football games and car races, and a real fan would like to do all of those things in the same day if they could. Right. They, they would love to see a race, a concert, and a football game all in the same experience if they could, but the, it's, it's the same mass of people moving around, and that's a lot of what we chased then, but most of it was just music. Uh, I look at music sort of like how I cook. Um, my mom taught me how to cook, and she said, just please yourself. Uh, if you do a good enough job of that, most people will like it, and that's kind of where I was with music. I, I, I just know what I like. I guess at this point I might know if it's really bad. Right. Um, but, you know, we just... There were a lot of us doing what we did over there, and we rode a wave and probably would still be running it, but we ran into the... Um, I've been through six corporate mergers in, wow. the, in my career, um, which has a lot to do with why I'm not in a corporation anymore. Right. And so it's all good. There's so no. so then you went from Sony to I went from Sony to Red Light Management, opened the Red Light office here. Um, and that was an interesting interlude there. It was when a lot of things I uh, initially I think Red Light was way ahead of its time in saying where the business was was going to go and In what way? How how would you well, most of the, um, it's when it first started to really become one business, being live merchandise, the digital era, and everything running into itself. And, and um, you think that was Corin, why he put the vision together with, with Music Today? No, yeah, I, I'm sure he everything. saw that. In fact, I know he did. We talked about it a lot. And 
then I moved from there and but red light as you know has gotten really big it's it's a yeah. big company it services a lot of people and it's worldwide and it's a, you know it's a very good company um I had a chance to work then with Borman Gary Borman and his company with Keith Urban and Lady Annabellum and um Faith Hill was there at that point and the artist just really interested me um uh, and was it that it was it was great artists and a smaller team? Yeah, the the size of it interests me because within size is there's a chance to be more mobile, and as things get bigger, they require either more people making more decisions or one person having to make a lot of decisions. Either way, it slows down a little bit. Uh, I like I like things to be a little more fluid, and but. Um, all businesses are run by people. Um, it doesn't matter if it's the digital business or, or what business. They're all run by people in the end. And um, people have different opinions and change. That's what makes the world go round. Um, and then that leads me to Crush. And Crush, pretty much, so far so good, is perfect for me. It's... Um, Let's come back to Crush. Okay. I want to talk about Crush in some at some length. My, All right. I, I, want, I have a question for you about you made this transition from running Sony to being mm -hmm. inside of a management company. And what year was that? Uh, it was two thousand and seven, I guess it was. So at this yeah. point, the writing's very well on the wall in terms of in terms of what's happening with with uh, where where the industry's going. Well, yeah, that said, was that's. I'm glad you asked me that. It was all based on a hunch of mine of just where where this business as a whole was going and where the control of it was going. Nothing ever moves as fast as people will project it to be. Remember, sure. 10 years ago was going to be the end of radio. Right. Um, and I don't think that happened yet, did it? Yeah. Um, and it's and we'll, always going to We'll talk be, about CRS well, it was in a moment. Be, it was going <laughs> to be the end of the record labels and everything. And, and I, don't, I don't have an evil thought in my head about, about major record companies. I made my living in the record business for 31 years um, and I'm really fortunate to have done that but uh, in those 31 years I was involved in six corporate mergers and takeovers and but I only lost my job once um, and that was the last one with Sony um, and that it was all based in mergers and size and restructuring and, and I honestly got off the merry-go-round at that point, had a number of chances to run more companies and big companies, and not that I don't have the stomach for it, I have the stomach for it just fine. Um, I really didn't want to do it anymore because what the guys and women do that run big companies now, it it's a constant uh, river of cutbacks, Restructurings, cutbacks, restructurings, cutback, restructurings. And, that, and that's because the the unit volume has decreased fifty percent. So you've well, got the unit to, you've volume, got to, you've yeah, got to decrease I, the cost structure to match. Yeah, when we talk about that Gretchen Wilson record that we were making here, I think that was one of the last records that. Well, there were a number of them right in that phase that we were selling. But at that point, I remember we were we were selling those records to Walmart for twelve dollars and ten cents, wholesale. That's a that's a rather large and uh, dramatic change from selling 29 cent downloads. Yeah. Um, well, and, and actually, and just to put some numbers behind it, you can tell me if these numbers are correct. What, I, what I've heard, I spoke with somebody from one of the majors uh, last week, and I was asking them some direct questions to someone in the finance department on mm -hmm. how budgets have changed relative to the decrease. And he, what he said is that the unit volume has decreased about 50%. And the wholesale value has decreased about 30%, but the budgets have only decreased about 30%. And I felt like, okay, now I understand what's going on. Why now I understand why the restructuring needs to happen, because you know the 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 value created by the industry has not decreased nearly as quickly as um, as the uh, as the actual dollars have. Is that? Do you think that's yeah. accurate? I I think the. Uh the matrix is accurate. The percentages could go as high as 70% in some areas of the downswing of the business. And um, 
it gets back to that people thing. People, people. It takes people to run businesses. People are expensive. And right. People. It. You it's know, overhead. Overhead, infrastructure. Um, you know, when you're, it costs a lot of money, and you have to continue to make cuts into areas of the business that people choose. Um, you know, the last area to get cut in most major companies is the business affairs department, and those are the people that are making the cuts. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people, I would put it this way, there's a lot of people adding up a lot less. Right. Um, there's not more people out making that happen. I don't think there's ever been a time in this business where more pure record people were probably needed in this business. And by um, more pure record people, you mean? At the creative end of it, people out looking for talent, developing talent is the big, it's really expensive to develop talent, to spot talent and then bring it along to the point where you want to deliver it to the masses is, that's a, that's a long, expensive ride and the record companies don't have the, you know, the bandwidth, the financial bandwidth to do that anymore. And people want things instantaneously, and music a lot of times doesn't work like that. Well, let's tie these things together then. I mean, because I think it's interesting that, that you, you left the record company, as you said, or you got off that merry-go-round, as you said, because you saw the power shifting from, mm -hmm. from the labels to managers, because managers are sort of the ones who do have that 360 deal with the artist, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the um, do you, do, do man, how do management companies uh, nurture an artist and do artist development, right? Because they used to rely on the dollars that came out of those record deals mm -hmm. to do that. So how do you do that at a management company today? How do you, how do you, how do you spot an artist and, and grow them at a management company? Where, how do you do it and where does that money come from? Well, you still use, I mean, there's still, don't get me wrong, record companies are still out there swinging hard if you happen to have an artist that's there. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, and I'm partners with a couple of major record companies right now in the development of artists, and it's, um, I would say we're equally invested. Um, right. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of sweat equity and patience involved in managing. Um, and when people talk to me about investors and opening companies and whatever, um, the money has to be patient because it simply doesn't happen overnight. Very few things do. Yeah. And Even the things that you think do didn't really happen overnight. No, no. They are, you, people like to ignore the, the previous five well, years. Yeah, the Civil Wars didn't just, somebody didn't just pour water into that packet last week and you had last year That's and they exactly had the civil right. wars. There's a lot um, of hard work that came before that. Yeah, people grow. They are. Uh, spotting them early on and able if you're able to stick with it and fight through you also find out who an artist is when you're nurturing them. Right. Uh, if they are who you thought they were. Well if if they have the stomach for it. Um, I tell people all the time if if you absolutely don't have to do this for a living, then you shouldn't do this for a living. Because right. it's hard. It's really hard. Um, a lot of patience involved. So as, as a management company then, are you, you know, you mentioned sweat equity. Um, is, is that, and, and are you still looking for partners on the dollar investment side as, as a manager? Well, you might be looking for partners as far as, um, you know, sponsorships and ways to chase things. Not everything costs a lot of money, but right. it costs some. Um, you know, I don't work with anybody that doesn't write. So, you know, publishers are great partners because they can supply a lot of things that the record company could also supply just by sheer numbers of people and having a publish. I look at the publishers as part of my team. There, that's who's they join. They usually join the fray pretty early as well, right. and there's some great experiences to be had out there. And uh, if everybody's not in a rush um, to become a star, um, a lot of a lot of 
a lot of the failures in this business are because people went too early and they pushed too much in too way too early on the artist and they weren't able they weren't ready to make that record or they weren't ready to sing on television or they weren't you only get one first impression yep Lana Del Rey comes to mind uh, you get one first ex impression you want to make every sure as much as you can that that's the right one that's and the one patience you want to show virtue, yeah yeah what let, let me ask you about Nashville in particular I mean you you um you've been here 18 years is mm -hmm. that what you said yeah How, what what makes Nashville Nashville what's particular about Nashville obviously lifestyle is great what about from a business perspective what's different about Nashville well, from a business perspective I think it's on that you can only find this in one place in the world um in a geographic area this small where we are today sitting here at Ocean Way you could you could hit a five iron to 20 recording studios, half of the record business and 150 publishers and managers and everybody, we all exist in a very small geographic area. Um, there's no place on earth where there's this many songwriters in one place um, applying they're you know toiling at their work all day every day and you can see it live you can walk from the songwriting experience into the studio experience into the artist experience the record company experience the agency experience all of that in six blocks seven days a week um it's always been a community that nurtures the song with BMI and ASCAP and CSAC having a major presence here forever. All of the, the major agents, talent agencies are here. You can do anything you need to do in the, in the recording industry or in the music industry from right here. Uh, the biggest presence, though, has always been songwriters. Right. And is, that, is, that, is it healthy? Like in the 18 years you've been here, how has it changed? It is, is it... You know, we, we, we hear about doom and gloom in the industry. Is there is there doom and gloom in the Nashville community and the songwriting community in particular? I think doom and gloom is easy to find. Um, I think periods such as these also show... They show me who people really are. If you really have to do this, if you really are committed to it, were you chasing money? Um, all of those things are pretty much answered here and played out here. Um, the only thing that's different with from Nashville to the rest of the music industry is the speed at which the business has come and gone. It's the last bastion of the physical record business. That's because a lot of our, our fans still buy physical discs. I mean, we were the, country music was the first music sold in Walmart It'll probably be the last music sold in Walmart. It yeah. just happens to be where our where our fan base lives. Um, as you can see in all the digital numbers and everything, the audience comes along um, as it gets younger, and we approach younger artists with this music. Um, if you really get into the heart of it, um, I don't think our fan base is any... Uh, less technologically adept than anybody else's audience. It's just how it's used and how they buy things. Right. Um, I, I would defy you to tell me that a 17-year-old kid in South Dakota right now uses their computer less than somebody that lives in the inner city of Chicago or New York, speaking, they probably use it more. Yeah, speaking as somebody who grew up in a town of 20,000 in Indiana, I'm sure they use it more because you're more well, starved yeah. for culture. I grew up in a in town of 3,000 people in Nebraska and listened to the radio all day and all night. And can you imagine if you had the access to culture well, with the yeah, internet it's the same, Yeah, it's the same thing. It's incredible. Um, that's where I MTV right. started was in those communities because the, you couldn't get it in the cities. Yeah. We, I, I, we used to have records breaking all over the Midwest when I was a promotion man and wonder where in the hell it was coming from. And it was coming from MTV because and we couldn't even get it. Yeah. You know, but those songs were being played on MTV. And if you're in, I, it's where I came from. If you're in Nebraska or South Dakota or North Dakota, 
in the middle of January, uh, you got a lot of time on your hands to be entertained. Tell, tell me about it. Yeah, so, I, I agree with you. I, I, this is a big, this is a theory of mine as well because having you know grown up with, with that small town experience where radio and MTV was culture and how starved you were for it. Yeah. And the other thing for me, I've noticed that all of my, you know, most of my, most of the people I went to high school with never left Goshen, Indiana, right? Mm -hmm. They all got on Facebook last year. I watched it happen because sure. they all tried to become my friends and many of them are now on Facebook. So like, you can see sort of the critical mass hitting at the same time that music has actually finally been unlocked online, right? Mm -hmm. You've got Spotify and Mog sure. and, you know, and so I think that that convergence is about to happen and I think you're right, the, the, um, the digital consumption is, is, is only going to increase. But where we are today, 40% digital nationwide, 20 to 25% digital in the country music space. It's got it's a long ways yeah, to go. It's also the age group of the audience. And as we develop more, I tell people all the time, young people all the time, it's your business. It's not mine. I'm, I'm 56 years old. Um, I would hardly look at me as a trendsetter. Uh, you would have but, been a young man at the time jumpers last night. I, I would absolutely <laughs> would have been, yeah. Um, but they, you know, as we attract more young people in the audience, that there's more Taylor Swifts and there's more Civil Wars and there's more Pistol Annies. And Miranda, if they, you know, that's not the same audience. If it's broken down, there's a reason why those digital numbers are way up. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of kids out there that listen to this music. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's turn to Crush Management now. Okay. Um, why Crush and what makes Crush special? Um, crush is a mindset for me. Um, Who is Crush, by the way? Just Crush is a company that was started by two guys in New York City. It's Jonathan Daniel and Bob McGlynn. Uh, they're they're a force in pop music. They they represent a number of artists in pop music, from Train to Fall Out Boy, Gym Class Heroes, Panic at the Disco, Courtney Love, Shaggy. It's um, it's a particular Foxy kind of Shazam. I mean, all these. It's a particular kind of niche that they've carved out, though. When you say on the on the pop music side, I mean those, you know, Fall Out Boy, Gym Class Heroes. They're they're in some ways kind of unlikely pop stars. Uh, yeah, a lot of those kids. Uh, Jonathan and Bob, I've known them since high school. Um, there's a development, Crush is a development company. And they, there's a lot of arms of Crush now um, out there with some enormous success in the company. Um, the way they go about it is what attracted me. If, if you don't Crush is very, Jonathan and Bob are very involved in the creative end of the artist's careers. They don't just farm it out to a producer and say, go make your record and have, you know, let me know when it's done. Um, they're very involved in that. They're very involved. The biggest department in the company is the, is the digital end of the company. That they, do, do a, they do a great job. Always have. They do a killer um, job on merchandising, too. They do a killer job in merchandising, too. That was all started by one guy at a desk that's branched out. It was a service to offer to the artists. Um, Crush is the, they're doers. What, so as doers and developers, I mean, what, what does that mean? Like when you say, I almost, it sounds like you're distinguishing a developer from a manager. What is that no, distinction? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, it's just, like I said, it's a mindset of finding an artist early in their career and developing them and staying with them um, and being able to do things all along the way that hopefully those decisions you know enhance the artist's career um, but it's all based up from music it's not it always yeah there's money involved everybody wants to make money but those decisions aren't I haven't ever seen a decision made at Crush yet creatively that was based because of, of money. I hope it's going to make money or, or I'm going to spend a few years of my life, um, you know, waving at cars going by. But I like to develop. That's what I like to do. I like to find young talent and find it, be the person that found it and then develop it um, and enhance it and give them their chance. Uh, that's what these guys like to do. But if you don't, so what want, does bringing that to Nashville mean? 
what is bringing it to yeah, Nashville? Well, mean? So when, when you that look at this challenge and say, how do I, okay, how do I take this and their model and bring that to Nashville? Well, what? that's what I do anyway, but I like a lot of their sensibilities from how pop music and crush handles their, the digital end of the business and everything from, from the first days of the websites on up and how they manage that. And if you don't, if you don't want me to be involved in the creative end of your career, then I'm the wrong manager for that. Um, that's what gets me off. That's what I like to do. And who are the first artists that you're starting with? Um, first artist that, that I signed was a woman named Kristen Kelly. She's signed at Sony. Uh, she's making a record with Tony Brown, and this is her first day at CRS um, in Nashville Country Radio Seminar. Her single comes out next month, and she's taking it to radio as we speak. Um, next artist I signed was a woman named Ashley Monroe, who I had signed at Sony a long time ago. And we're making a record with Vince Gill and Justin Niebank producing Ashley Monroe, um, which I would describe to you as it's so country, it's alternative. It's the most country record I've been involved with in all 18 years here. Wow. Um, except for the Hank Williams senior catalog that I sold at Mercury. Um, and I have a young duo by the name of Striking Matches who were students at Belmont and I saw them on YouTube and I taught a class at Blair School of Music a year ago last winter and walked in one day after I saw them on YouTube and one of them was sitting in this class. Um, that's Nashville. Right. Um, it's a, it's a show up town. Um, that's, and about to go into the studio with Luke Wooten to make a record with striking matches. That's, 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 that's the, in a nutshell is crush. Um, I'm not necessarily chasing developed artists that could instantly make money, that'd be nice. But if it doesn't work for us creatively, then it doesn't work. And with um, each of those artists, you'll leverage what Crush has on the digital side, on the merchandising side, on the touring yes. side. What, else, what am I forgetting? Anything? Uh, all of it. The entire... The, I would like to bring... I hate to call it pop sensibilities, but how they run their business in pop music in into Nashville or into our artists in Nashville. I don't right. care what everybody else does. I'm pretty much tunnel vision on what sure. we want to do, but just the speed and how they attack that end of the business and all of those services are available to these artists too. And the other thing about it, when you say why crush, as soon as I brought those artists one at a time to my partners and crushed, they, they listened and said, yeah, that sounds like that's exactly like what we want to do. Awesome. All right, well, good luck with those. Thanks. Wait, just a couple of final questions for Bye. you. You mentioned CRS. What the hell is CRS? CRS is Country Radio Seminar. I've been here 18 years. I guess this would be my 18th one. Um, basically, I'm sure 90-some percent of the country radio stations in America all gather in Nashville for five days and have a seminar. Hence... All the record companies, agencies, publishing companies, everybody try to put their wares in front of them since the biggest driver in country music is still country radio. Um, and that happens all right here in Nashville. For so this is, this is sort, of, sort of like the fan summit, but for radio folks to come out and meet the artists and yes. hear everything. Um, yeah. wow. It's and fanfare I've, I've, for radio. I've heard it's a... Um, I've heard it's it's uh it's quite a scene on the at, at the town at night. CRS is quite a scene. You can choose um, how deeply you want to immerse yourself into that scene. Um, you know, it's 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 a great chance to put yourself and your artists in front of uh, that many purveyors of the music. You know, that's who takes it back to the fans in their marketplaces, um, or not. Right. Well, thank you so it's, much. It's for a, it. It's, it could be a huge blessing. It could also, if you do it wrong, like I say, you only get one first impression. If you do right. it wrong, you it could, could be then, the, it could be the death knell. You could whiff. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much for spending the thank time. You, I have one final question for you. Okay. If you're going to make a musical recommendation for our audience, what would it be? Something that they should go buy? Something I should go buy? That's for sale today. Um, I just heard it was coming out today. I would buy the new... Um, there's a Chieftains tribute that T-Bone Burnett produced um, that is available, I think, now, maybe yeah. today. It's 50 years of the Chieftains uh, done by a really interesting, eclectic group of artists, and one of mine is on there, too. That's why I know. Uh, Pistol Annie's and Ashley Monroe did a, a track on it, and I think T-Bone will do it. I haven't heard a note of it. I think he'll do... A great honor to the chieftains. I, I trust in the man for music. Exactly. All right, well, I'll go grab that. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you so much for spending the time. My really pleasure. appreciate it. Good luck with thanks all for having. Oh, yeah. I'll need it. And thanks, everybody, for watching This Week in Music, live from Ocean Way in Nashville. See you next time. I feel good, uh, even though I shouldn't. I'm chilling so hard, couldn't tell you where the hood is. Uh, I'm looking like a million bucks, sucker. I'm